this is the third session. So we have Dr. Q as our chairperson here for today and Dr. Zawani is our speaker. Um, just a short notice everyone, at the end of this uh, uh, lecture, the, uh, there will be a QR code uh, for you to claim your MMA CPD points. So after the lecture, you can all scan and use your QR code to claim your points. All right. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Q for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Mabel. Uh, must once again thank the College of Physicians uh, that uh, this uh, webinar has been organized and uh, thank the uh, group of people from uh, Taiping Hospital, aided by Dr. Chia Wee Kui uh, and Dr. Mabel and company uh, to uh, put together this uh, very uh, educational uh, webinars uh, for the last, this is the third week, uh, as you have heard. Uh, and today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Zawani uh, Zainuddin, who is a consultant, a senior consultant of gastroenterology in Hospital Sutana Bahia in Alosta. She is MBBS UM, MRCP UK, and she had her gastroenterology specialty training in the year 2009 to 2012 where she spent two years in Hospital Sultana Bahia and another two years at Hospital Selayang. Uh, besides being a very active clinician, she is also involved in a number of clinical trials related to the treatment of ulcerative colitis, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. Uh, and she's also part of the development group committee member for the uh, Malaysian colorectal cancer and hepatitis C practice guidelines. So uh, she had chosen a very uh, uh, appropriate uh, topic to talk on, that is advancement in the treatment of hepatitis C. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Zawani, please. All right, thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Q. Thank you for, to the organizing committee. I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, webinar series. Uh, thank you again for having uh, me with you. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, can you see my slides? Yes. All right, okay. All right, the topic of my lecture today will be about management of chronic hepatitis C. Uh, the landscape of hepatitis C has changed very much uh, recently with the introduction of highly efficacious direct acting antivirals. Uh, once deemed untreatable in the past, hepatitis C now is curative. This is the uh, content of my talk for today. I will talk a little bit about hepatitis C and the, its natural history of chronic infection, treatment, current treatment with direct acting antivirals, and how do we go about uh, offering treatment to this patient pre-assessment, uh, pre-treatment assessment, monitoring during treatment, and as well as managing drug-to-drug -drug interaction if there is any. Right, it is interesting to note that uh, viral hepatitis C is, uh, has been recently properly named only in 1989. Prior to that, it has been called non-A, non non-B, an infection which was noted uh, to occur following blood transfusion then. Uh, people don't know what causes it. A lot of people became sick, became jaundice, developed hepatitis, and they call it non-A, non-B hepatitis. And in 1989, only it is properly named as hepatitis C. And a remarkable uh, medical achievement over the last couple of years has uh, managed uh, to offer treatment, uh, curative treatment, in such that WHO targeted by 2030 that we are able to eliminate this uh, threat of hepatitis C in uh, has a public uh, global public health problem. All right, this is a little bit about the virus. It is a small size envelope single stranded RNA. Uh, the hepatitis C virus, yeah, virus. Is acute and chronic yeah. hepatitis C infection. Okay. And the, the illness, uh, the white, it causes white a spectrum of severity from which uh, the infection can be asymptomatic to mild and to serious lifelong uh, complication. 
All right, this is the uh, classic slide showing that how hepatitis C can be transmitted and has, I think many of us are aware, it is a blood-borne infection and mainly many of our patients obtain the infection through uh, intravenous drug use and before the safe practice of blood transfusion, uh, some uh, significant problems portion also got it from a blood trans, uh, transfusion eh, before effective screening will be available. All right, this is our Malaysian statistic. If you are interested, this document is available online. You can uh, uh, download it. Uh, the incident rate uh, per 100,000 population in Malaysia has rose from 2.56 in 2010 to about 9.54 in 2017. We, didn't, we don't think there's actually an increase in the uh, infection per se, but I think because of more uh, aggressive notification by practitioners. The natural uh, history of hepatitis C infection upon acquiring the virus, about 70 to 75 to 80 uh, percent of patients will develop chronic hepatitis. And from this, about 20 to 30 percent will develop cirrhosis. And once cirrhosis set in, about 2 to 7 percent of patients per year will develop end stage liver disease and as well as HCC, hepatite, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's interesting to see that this uh, chronic infection takes time to cause significant liver uh, damage. And with timely treatment, we can arrest the disease progression and, of course, uh, prevent uh, death. Okay, this is an important slide in which that I want you all to, uh, to know that hepatitis C is a curable disease. Yeah? Uh, unlike hepatitis B and HIV treatment currently, which the treatment uh, being offered now is actually lifelong virus suppression. Current treatment with hepatitis C now is uh, considered uh, curative. Yeah? This is because the viral genome does not enter into our genetic makeup and thus making uh, uh, treatment uh, more efficacious and uh, the virus can be uh, cleared from our body. Right. And given the lack of an effective vaccine, Optimal treatment of chronic hep C infection is now perceived as a must in terms of public health strategies. Right, complete clearance of the virus after treatment, uh, we call it sustained virological response, is an indicative of cure. Sustained virological response uh, is uh, defined as undetectable hep C RNA. Uh, following completion of treatment, we usually check uh, for uh, this about three or three months post-treatment. If SVR is achieved, uh, then we call it uh, it's curative. Eh? And uh, this is the first chronic viral illness uh, that we are able to cure. And some of you might uh, know that uh, Michael Houghton was recently uh, being given Nobel Prize eh, uh, jointly for jointly discovering hepatitis C in 1989. Right. And with a current effective treatment, uh, WHO has targeted that by 2030, uh, we should be able to uh, eliminate the threat of hepatitis C as a serious uh, public health concern. And uh, this is our National Strategic Plan for Viral Hepatitis, adopted from WHO uh, goal, uh, in which we want to uh, uh, we want to screen a population to achieve 90% population living with viral hepatitis to be diagnosed and to achieve 90% reduction of new cases of viral hepatitis to reduce mortality due to viral hepatitis by 65% by the year 2030 and to ensure that 90% of those eligible population for treatment are uh, being treated by 2030. Uh, one of the stumble block of hepatitis C treatment is that uh, many of patients living with hepatitis C are not aware that they are infected. And uh, in 2015, it is estimated that there are about 71 million out of the world population having chronic hepatitis C and less than 15% of those infected with hepatitis C are being diagnosed. Right. 
and as such, uh, it is uh, important uh, for primary care clinician, family medicine specialists uh, to be actively uh, screening patient for hepatitis C in order for us to find the missing millions. I think many of us are aware uh, which group are at high risk for developing hepatitis C infection. And this is what we are doing now uh, in our practice clinically. We offered screening for this group of patients, but many of our patients sometimes don't own up uh, to this, um, especially when they have a history of high risk behavior in the past. Yeah, All right. And uh, many develop, developed countries actually now are recommending for one time Hep C testing so that we can actually uh, uh, discover more of the patient with hepatitis C. In fact, this is from uh, a uh, uh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, the recommendation from. Uh, uh, AASD, uh, the, uh, the body governing uh, the, uh, 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 the, what do you call that? The recommendation for screening in uh, one of the body recommendation, recommending screening for uh, patient in America. They recommended that they, uh, everyone be screened uh, for hepatitis C. One time routine opt out hep C testing is recommended for all individuals aged 18 years or older. And for those less than 18 years who had uh, high risk activities, uh, exposures or circumstances associated with an increased risk of hep C infection to be offered screening as well. All right. So this is uh, how I think we should uh, go about in future as well. Eh? And those people who are still uh, uh, participating in high risk activity, uh, they recommend that annual hep C uh, screening be offered to them as well. Okay, uh, before I go on about uh, direct acting antivirals, I think it is uh, interesting uh, to share this slide with you on how Hep C therapy has evolved over the past few, the past years. Yeah, in early 1990s, where people don't know what to give to treat hepatitis C, uh, they started to use interferons. Uh. Interferons are actually uh, proteins that our body produce when we are exposed to pathogen like bacterial viruses. And these are the chemicals that actually causes us to have fever, the flu-like symptoms. And you can imagine treatment with interferon cause, uh, causes uh, a lot of side effects actually. And uh, with conventional interferons where the injection uh, were given three times per week, you can see the dismayal results. Uh, maybe around 16% were only being able to, to get rid of the virus. And later on, they added ribavirin. Also, uh, the efficacy is about 42%. And pegylated interferon enters the market in early uh, 2000, uh, in which the injection now is once a week. Coupled with ribavirin, uh, the efficacy is about 55%. But treatment, I tell you, were rather toxic. So people will uh, feel unwell throughout the one year of treatment. Uh, and many patients were not being able uh, to receive treatment because uh, a lot of contraindication. You know? Patients with uh, autoimmune diseases uh, were not uh, were contraindicated to receive interferon. Uh, patients who have neuropsychiatric illnesses, uh, men, patients with many comorbids. Yeah? So more, most often or not, no, we are not able to offer treatment for, uh, for our patient then. Yeah? And in 2011, uh, the first uh, DA uh, were available in the form of protease in inhibitors. It was a uh, coupled with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, the uh, efficacy is much better in which patient uh, we are able to cure about 70% of our patients. However, treatment is still toxic yeah, because of the more tablets to take and uh, the interferon is still on board. Yeah. And in 2013, more DAs were being made available and they were added to the combo treatment and efficacy were about uh, 90%. And from there on, uh, we have moved uh, away from interferon and the current treatment actually uh, the, now that we are giving uh, interferon free all oral uh, combination in which is so effective that we are able to treat about more than 95% of our patients. Yeah? 
So current oral uh, direct acting antiviral for hepatitis C can achieve high cure rates. It is simple to take uh, and well, very well tolerated. All right. This is uh, the current uh, direct acting antivirals that are available. These drugs uh, uh, are formulated to target uh, the non-structural proteins of the virus in which uh, it inhibits the natural replicative state of the virus. Yeah? There are three uh, types of, uh, uh, there are three groups of drugs in which protease inhibitor, you can uh, identify the drugs which, uh, in which it ends with Provir. And uh, NS5 inhibitors, it ends with Asvir. And, and, and the last group is NS5B polymerase inhibitors in which it ends with Buvera. And like HIV treatment, uh, the uh, uh, regime of drug is in combination to prevent uh, viral resistance. It should never be used alone. And what do you call that? Uh, treatment is finite. Uh, there is a duration for it. Uh, and these are the combination of drugs that have been given over time. And because of the rapid pace of uh, changes uh, in the treatment of hepatitis C, if you read major international guidelines, these are the only three combination of drugs that are being, give, uh, being recommended uh, in, uh, in inter man many international bodies. Uh. Uh, these are uh, Sorfosbervir, Velpatasbir, uh, Glicoprovir, Pibrantasvir, and soft vapor and voxiprovir. Yeah? All right, these uh, combinations are pan genotypic, in which you don't need to check for genotype of the hepatitis C. All right. Okay. Um, what do we have in Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia? Um, because of the high cost incurred yeah, with direct acting antivirals, we uh, this is what we uh, have in uh, KKM now. Uh, we have Sophos Bovir and Dakla Tasvir combination, right? And why does this uh, combination being dropped out from the recommendation in many uh, international guidelines? It is because, not that it is a, a bad drug actually, but because Sof and Dakla in some studies has shown to be a less effective in genotype 3 cirrhosis. I will show you the data later. But however, in real world practice, a soft DACLA in genotype 3 cirrhosis has actually achieved quite good result, more than 85% uh, SVR. Okay, let us look at the uh, uh, soft VELPA, the pan genotypic co uh, combination. All right, uh, for all genot it can use for all genotype with a response rate of 98%. Uh, cirrhotic or non-cirrhotic, the overall uh, achievement is 98% as well, uh, based on uh, ESTRO 1, 2 and 3 studies. And for the glicoprovir pibrantasvir combination, uh, it is pan-genotypic as well. Uh, all right, and um, it, uh, in uh, genotype 1, 2, 4, 5 and 6, it can achieve 98% of uh, uh, successfulness. And for uh, this is a non inferiority uh, study comparing soft and DACLA for uh, genotype 3, uh, as, uh, SVR rate of 95%, and as well as uh, what we call 98% as well uh, in the treatment naive cirrhosis and treatment naive, uh, treatment experience uh, cirrhosis as well. Okay, this is the efficacy of Dakla Tasvir and Sofosbivir that we are using. And as you can see, it's not too bad uh, for cirrhotic uh, patients, advanced cirrhosis. Uh, the SVR rate is uh, based on this study is actually 83%. But, uh, but as I have said earlier, in a real world experience, uh, the SVR rate is more than 85%. And how about a soft, a dark, a soft DACLA combination for inpatient with HIV infection? And you can see that the efficacy rate is good as well. Okay, let me, see, let me show you. For HIV hep C infection with cirrhosis, we are able to achieve about 
right? This is for naive, this is for experience. Huh? Uh, no cirrhosis, 98 to 100%, and with cirrhosis, 89, 89 to 93%, right? It doesn't matter how high your viral load is, the hepatitis C viral load risk, the response is good. And this is for genotype 3. Uh, this is the uh, study uh, that showed the slightly um, uh, inferior uh, response rates to genotype 3. Right? Okay, uh, so for cirrhosis in this study, SBR rate for soft and dark uh, that we use uh, only managed to achieve clearance rates of about 63%. And um, yeah. But, uh, however, smaller studies uh, using soft and uh, DACLA in combination with Ribavirin uh, has shown that the efficacy of uh, soft DACLA uh, usage in treatment of hepatitis C genotype 3 cirrhosis can achieve cure rate of more than 85%. Right. Uh, and as you all know, the clinical benefits obtained by treatment hepatitis C is, of course, to get rid of the virus. And, and once we are able to eradicate the virus, we hope to reduce necroinflammation and reduce extra hepatic manifestations, stop uh, the uh, disease progress and prevent cirrhosis and its complication, and as well increase the survival rate of our patients. Okay, this is adopted from EASL. Uh, indication for treatment, yeah? whom should be treated uh, because the, these drugs that are available now is uh, simple to use and, very, is, and it is uh, uh, safe with very little side effects. All patients with hepatitis C infection must be considered for therapy, including those who, who had, uh, uh, had experienced treatment as well. So it's a very open kind of statement. Everybody must be considered for therapy. Eh? Uh, I've received a call last week from FMS who said I've got a 75 patient, 75 year old patient. Should I offer treatment? I said why not? Eh? Why not? So age is not uh, what do you call that? Uh, consideration uh, at all, right? Eh? And patients who should be treated without delay, of course, those that who had uh, significant liver damage, a significant fibrosis or sclerosis, they want to wait. Uh, those who have significant extra hepatic manifestations, such as nephrotic syndrome, all that. Uh, those who had recurrence of hepatitis C after liver transplantation. Those at rapid evolution of liver disease due to concurrent com 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 comorbidity. Comorbidities. Uh, this one is especially those Hep C co-infected with HIV. Eh? Studies have shown that if you got two virus, uh, the decline in your uh, liver condition is much faster. So you don't uh, keep your HIV patient aside. Eh? So you must refer them early for treatment. And individual at risk of transmitting hepatitis C. Eh? This group uh, in the past, we we you know we we think that they are difficult people. We should. Uh, uh, treatment were not made readily available for them. But we know that these people are the reservoir in, of infection and we should go uh, out and you know offer treatment for this group of patients. Uh, people with uh, intravenous drug usage, uh, um, uh, those who uh, engages in high-risk uh, activities. Yeah? So we don't, uh, you know, uh, ignore this group of patients anymore, right? In patients with decompensated cirrhosis and indication for liver transplantation, transplant first and treat after transplantation, of course, in those uh, uh, centers that has it. But uh, in our setting where transplantation might not be uh, uh, easily obtained, we go and treat our patient. Uh, even they are at Charles B or C, uh, and treatment need to be, of course, uh, monitored closely. Treatment is uh, generally not recommended if patient with limited life expectancy due to other non-liver related comorbidities. Right. This is uh, uh, I truncated from a WHO organization guideline for the treatment of uh, hepatitis C. It is a very uh, uh, simple uh, uh, algorithm. All right. 
So I'll go through quickly. Uh, right, how do we uh, test uh, ataupun kita screen uh, for hepatitis C? What we use now is hepatitis C antibody. You can do it uh, based on uh, lab base where you need to take the blood and send to our lab. Or now there are kits, uh, rapid test kit where you can screen for antibodies. Uh, right. Okay, if your antibody screening is negative, we stop at that. Nah? Right. However, if the antibody screening is positive, we need to proceed to supplementary test to see whether the patient is viremic or not. Nah? So what we can do is using hepatitis C RNA or hepatitis C antigen. All right. If either one of these come back as positive, then patient has uh, 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 hepatitis C, in, uh, active hepatitis C infection. If hepatitis C RNA or hepatitis C antigen negative, there's no viremia and no hepatitis C infection and this patient does not need treatment. Alright? Okay, those that have either hepatitis C RNA detected or hepatitis C uh, antigen detected, should be offered treatment and uh, and this is the suggestion by this guideline right uh, or the first thing you need to do is to see whether the patient has uh, fibrosis or not uh, simple bedside test or you can do it uh, we call it clinic uh, based test is a pre score where you need to have the AST of the patient and uh, platelet count it's a simple calculator that uh, can predict whether the patient has cirrhosis or not nah? Okay, those patients uh, without cirrhosis, uh, these are the combination recommended by this guideline. Uh, soft Velpa for 12 weeks, soft Dakla for 12 weeks. WHO still include Dakla Tasbe in their recommendation. Eh? Glicoprobil, Pibren Tasbe for 8 weeks. Those with cirrhosis, uh, right? This is the combination about the same. Uh, just that for soft and Dakla recommended longer for 24 weeks. Yeah. All right. Okay. Once you have offered treatment uh, and patient had completed the said duration of treatment, you go on and assess cure. Uh, cure, as I mentioned now, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, is called SVR, sustained virological response, at 12 weeks after the end of treatment. You don't check for SVR immediately after the last dose of treatment but you wait after three months of uh, completing the treatment and you send the viral load. Huh? If the viral load is not detected, then we call it has achieved cure. All right? Okay. All right. This is uh, the latest recommendation from uh, European Association for the Study of Liver. Just uh, published, uh, I think, in July this year. Yeah? Again, they have made it so simple. Yeah. Huh? <clears throat> Uh, if you have uh, this pen genotypic drug combination, you don't need to uh, check for genotype. What you need to know is just the cirrhosis status. Uh, this is the simplified treatment uh, algorithm, right? So for soft and uh for whether you have a cirrhosis or compensated cirrhosis, the treatment is the same, uh, 12 weeks. For glycoprovel, prebrantasvel, for those without cirrhosis, 8 weeks. Compensated cirrhosis, 12 weeks. That's all. Huh? Very easy. But for those, uh, this is a rather, what do you call it? Uh, an elabor rather elab elaborated uh, suggestion. If uh, you decide to do genotype, okay, right? Um, about the same. Uh, it's just that uh, this combination, uh, Grazoprovir and Elbatasvir on your most right uh, hand side is uh, only uh, being recommended for genotype 1B, right? Okay, so this is uh, the recommendation. Yeah? So treatment is finite, short, uh, either 8 to 16 weeks. Yeah? All right, so what do we do with, when we have uh, a patient who has uh, been uh, uh, shown to have active hepatitis C and you are all going to offer treatment for the patient, right? Uh, as usual, uh, you need to document a patient's medical history. Of course, uh, medical comorbidities is important, diabetes, uh, uh, patient, whether the patient has a concurrent nafal, uh, fatty liver or not. Uh, importantly, you have to review is the uh, medication that the patient is on because you want to check for drug-to-drug -drug interaction. And of course, whether the patient has 
any other food infection as well. So I usually, we usually we send for hepatitis B and HIV screening as well. And assess whether if patient is cirrhotic, they have complication of uh, cirrhosis as well or not. And prior treatment for Hep C, whether they had received treatment for Hep C, yeah? because some uh, drugs, if you are uh, treatment experience, you need to uh, give it on a long, slightly longer duration. Yeah? And uh, please don't forget to see whether the patient has been vaccination vaccinated for Hep B and Hep A as well, uh, as well. Yeah? And uh, just to remind you all, Hep C does not just affect the liver, it can affect and, uh, some other organs as well. Notably, uh, we, have, we, we, are, we have seen quite a few nephrotic syndrome due to chronic Hep C infection. This is the baseline infection uh, investigation before we start treatment. Uh, for, uh, uh, full blood count, LFT, AST, basically uh, we, because we want to calculate for APRI score creatinine and if they are uh, cirrhotic INR. Eh? Okay, uh, an assessment of fibrosis, you can do this simple, uh, uh, for, what do you call that, scoring. Uh, you can download this app eh, if you want. And those centers uh, who which has uh, non-invasive liver fibrosis assessment, uh, we can use transient elastography or shear with elastography to document whether they have cirrhosis on, or not. Eh? Um, uh, in my clinic, usually once uh, I diagnose that the patient has cirrhosis, I will send for genotype because I want to see whether this is genotype 3 or not. If genotype 3, uh, usually soft and dark color will be given for 24 weeks uh, in addition with rebarbering. And other relevant investigation based on the clinical discretion and ultrasound, uh, if patient has cirrhosis, we want to see whether a uh, patient has a, any, you know, any complication from cirrhosis such as HCC on board already or not and of course before you start treatment uh, like any other uh, uh, diseases uh, perform hepatitis uh, education it's important to tell your patient that even uh, uh, after clearing the virus uh, you will able to get it again if you uh, you know you you resume back on high risk activities yeah you know uh, you can uh, get hepatitis C reinfection uh, again. And of course, while on treatment for a woman, a woman, we need to advise on contraception and explain clearly on the treatment follow up and schedule. All right, uh, usually I will get my pharmacist to help me out on this. Um, you're right. Uh, lives make easy with uh, a lot of things nowadays. We have an app to check for drug interaction. You can download this if you are going to treat hepatitis C. Uh, I think it's important for you to download this app where you can check uh, uh, for drug to drug interaction. Nah? Right. What we are worried about drug to drug interaction is certain drugs can decrease the plasma uh, level of uh, our DAAs eh? and thus uh, make our treatment less efficacious. Eh? So this is the uh, an example uh, when you key in the drugs that you want to check. And for this, uh, uh, this is an example where Dacla and Phenetoin should not be co-administered. Eh? Right? And uh, potential, if you type amlodipine, they will right there, uh, Dacla and amlodipine potential interaction, right? And uh, because this is a sh rather short uh, duration of treatment, uh, I do switch uh, my patient who is on amlodipine to other antihypertensive uh, because I don't want to risk um, um, uh, my patient, uh, uh, what do you call that? So I don't want to them to, you know, to, to, uh, I want them to to you know to achieve uh, expected uh, clearance rate of the infection. Yeah? So I do switch uh, 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 calcium channel blockers while they're on treatment. So chonto, uh, another chonto is prednisolone. Uh, there's no interaction and statin uh, also shown to have some interaction with daclatazvir. And again, if uh, my patient is on statin just for simple dyslipidemia or that, I will stop the statin for three months. Yeah? Okay, right. This is how you go about if there is a drug to drug interaction, stop the particular related drug for the period of treatment and or replace the drug with an alternative product without a drug interaction in the same therapeutic class. Yeah? 
Alright, this is the sum of the example. And a drug dispensing, I'll get my pharmacist to help me out. And uh, for those patients, you think that, uh, you know, they are a bit difficult for them to come or come often. Uh, I will see them for uh, after one month just to make sure that, you know, they don't have uh, any significant uh, complaint about the medication. And you can dispense the rest of the medication until the end of therapy. Yeah? Again, um, counsel about adherence and uh, how... Uh, and what do you call that? Uh, and make sure for them to, you know, to take the drug as instructed. Eh? Because we don't want to risk them uh, uh, to, to, to reduce the rate of efficacy of the treatment. And monitoring during treatment is actually very simple. Uh, because the drugs are generally well tolerated. Uh, we have treated an uh, elderly patient. Eh? We have treated 82 years old, 83 years old, eh? and they have got no significant side effects. Eh? Uh, the most is maybe a bit of uh, a dyspepsia, headache, yeah? uh, and I think uh, nothing much uh, of, uh, of significance. Yeah? And uh, the fre frequencies of high grade or severe adverse event leading to discontinuity discontinuation are very low. Um, in fact, uh, all of our patients that we have uh, prescribed DAA are able to tolerate. Yeah? There are one or two dropout because of, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, adherence problem, right? So usually we see them at four weeks of treatment and after that you can schedule to see them at end of treatment. And uh, uh, with the current DAA, um, the what do you call that? Uh, the re, uh, for sofosbuvir initially, uh, if you look at the ESL recommendation in 2030, in 2018, uh, they said that you should be careful uh, with those patients who has reduced G EGFR. However, with this uh, latest. Um, uh, ESO recommendation, it said that sofos behavior even in end-stage renal failure is safe. Eh? So usually there's no drug uh, uh, modification uh, in patient with uh, end-stage renal failure, right? I've not stopped a patient with uh, hepatitis flare. I've never seen one during treatment. And of course, those patients uh, whom I added ribavirin, uh, you all guys know that ribavirin is associated with hemolytic anemia. Uh, HB need to be checked uh, quite regularly. Yeah? Maybe uh, two weekly in the first month. If they are tolerating your dose well, then you can check it on every month. Right, and for those patients who has, um, you know, uh, uh, other comorbids, uh, your follow-up plan may need to be changed a little bit more for frequent uh, monitoring. Yeah? So based on your patient's uh, characteristic as well. Okay, right. Um, Post-treatment follow-up. Uh, in those patients who had achieved SVR, meaning that after three months of completing treatment and the hep C RDA is not detected anymore, those who has no significant fibrosis, you can discharge them. Yeah. So it's, it's good. Nah? You, you can actually uh, reduce your clinic uh, patients now. Huh? However, those with significant fibrosis and cirrhosis, uh, you need to monitor them because although you can reduce the risk of HCC, but you cannot eliminate the risk uh, altogether. Right? And of course, explain again that reinfection is, uh, is possible and to modify their risk behavior, especially in those IVD use group of patients. Yeah? Right? Okay. This is my last slide. Uh, we have actually uh, produced our own uh, CPG guideline. You can download it uh, uh, online. All right. This is an algorithm or management of chronic hepatitis C. Uh, as recommended. Yeah? Okay, I think we'll go through it uh, quickly. Again, screening uh, using Hep C antibody. Uh, if negative, there's no Hep C V infection. If Hep C antibody positive, okay, okay, right, we need to notify, don't forget. And proceed to, proceed to confirmatory testing using either Hep C core antigen or Hep C RNA. 
and if the results is negative, there's no Hep C infection. Eh? There's no active hepatitis C infection, and if positive, assessment prior to initiating, ther initiating therapy, which include history taking, like I've mentioned just now, physical examination, assessment for liver fibrosis or cirrhosis using EPRI score, transient elastography, or even ultrasound and screen for potential drug-to-drug -drug interaction and blood investigation, FBC, CRAC, ALT, AST, screening for other co-infection. Eh? Alright, for those non-serotic uh, patient, EPRI score we define as less than 1.5 or using FIT4 calculator is less than 3.25 uh, or transient elastography 12 point, uh, less than 12.5 Okay, right. Um, you can initiate treatment. Yeah. Uh, if the drugs are available, initiate uh, uh, treatment uh, what you call as soon as possible. And uh, after your treatment, if the patient achieve SBR twelve, you can uh, actually uh, no risk of infection, not cirrhotic. You can discharge your patient from follow up. Yeah. Those have risk of infection, like uh, the group of patient which I mentioned, like I will use all that. Periodic Hep C core antigen testing is recommended. And those who has also cleared hepatitis C virus but has cirrhosis, don't forget that the risk for, the risk for HCC is still there. And we do continue on with the varicell surveillance. And for, right, for cirrhosis, defined in this chart is that EPI score more than 1.5, for score more than 3.25 or transient elastography more than 12.5 right okay right uh, I hope that I've de delivered uh, a clear lecture on the current treatment of hepatitis C to everyone thank you thank you very much Dr Zawani for a very clear and uh, very excellent lecture on uh, chronic hepatitis C. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have here uh, a few questions. Some of them you have actually more or less addressed. Uh, the first question is, once cured of hep C, what's the recommendation for follow-up for cirrhosis or non cirrhotic patient? You have more or less addressed Okay, Unless you want to add anything. non cirrhotic uh, patient uh, and those that had, has no risk of uh, uh, acquiring the infection again, you can actually uh, discharge them. But for cirrhotic patient, uh, I will see them every six months. Yeah? They will need HCC surveillance using ultrasound and as well as alpha fetoprotein for uh, every six months. Yeah? And don't forget that a lot of our patients now has fatty liver as well. Even though you have uh, uh, eradicated the hepatitis C, ongoing fatty liver also uh, you know, can uh, make the patient uh, uh, liver disease progress as well. Sure. Uh, the second question here is uh, about the uh, hospital. Some hospital only has uh, HCV core antigen. Right. but don't have uh, HCV RNA. So okay. can you use the core antigen to check for SVR? Yes, you can. Treatment? Yes, you can. Yes. You okay. can do it three months after treatment or six months after treatment. It's okay. Okay. So that's as good as the yes, RNA? Yep, yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, in the case of Hep B and C co-infection, which one would you treat first? Okay, and, right. Hep uh, whether we can treat concurrently. All right. For hep, when patient have Hep B and Hep C, uh, uh, the what do you call that? You need to assess the Hep B as usual whether patient need hepatitis B treatment or not. Uh? so you need to have E antigen, E antibody, hepatitis B viral load as well. And uh, most often than not, uh, when patient have uh, these two uh, viruses together, the hepatitis B somehow is being suppressed. Yeah, uh, but um, what we do is if patient has Hep B and you think that Hep B uh, viral load is low and probably uh, not needing treatment but you want to treat Hepatitis C, Hepatitis B you need to give prophylaxis for a flare-up. So for those uh, 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 patients who has concurrent Hep B and Hep C, 
in which Hep B is not active, very low viral load, not detected, but you want to start hepatitis treatment, you need to start antiviral for Hep B. So continue together, Hep B and Hep C treatment. And once Hep C has, uh, you have stopped treatment for Hep C, uh, Hep B treatment, uh, you can stop 12 weeks after that. Uh, provided that after that, you need to regularly monitor because Hep B flare up following uh, Hep C treatment has been reported. So which uh, anti-Hep C uh, antiviral will you be using? For Hep B, eh, is it? For Hep B? For Hep B, uh, yes, yes, I Hep think B. the drugs that are available now we have is Entercover or Tenofovir. Either one is okay, right? And sure. for Hep C, that we, what we have now is Soft and Dakla. So if you are usually sure. when they have co-infection with Hep B, the Hep B is well suppressed. Yeah, but uh, when you okay. want to start Hep C, you need to start antiviral prophylaxis for Hep B. So I usually start Hep B treatment about a few weeks before Hep C treatment, and continue on together with the hepatitis C uh, treatment. And once you complete the Hep C treatment, you can continue the Hep B for another twelve weeks and see whether uh, and you can stop it. And after that, you just continue follow up. But those patients who already cirrhotic, although the Hep B viral load is rather low, uh, what do you call that? Uh, usually, I will continue on Hep B uh, and uh, treatment uh, lifelong as well. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is: What uh, DAA can be used in uh, end stage renal failure patient? All right. Uh, uh, we can use uh, so the what do you call that the pen genotypic combination. In fact, all combination can be used yeah, without dose adjustment. So you can use soft fosbuvir, daclatazvir without dose adjustment. You can so use soft velpa without so without dose adjustment. You can use glicoprovir and pibrentazvir without dose adjustment. Okay. All can be used. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, next question is, when can patients start to plan uh, pregnancy uh, after treatment for Hep C? After clearing, uh, I suppose. All right, yeah. Uh, I think after we document that the SBR has been achieved, uh, three months after the treatment, uh, and if there's no other contrary indication, uh, like patients don't have decompensated cirrhosis, I think they can go on and plan their pregnancy. Okay, thanks. Uh, the, the next question is about APRI score and imaging like elastogram. Yeah. What's the correlation? Okay, right. Of course, um, if you have got the facility for transient elastography or shear wave elastography, it is, of course, uh, better than APRI score. APRI score is uh, what do you call it? It's a simple calculator. Uh, sensitivity and sens uh, specificity for what do you call that? Uh, for cirrhosis is probably moderately uh, good. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that uh, one, uh, I think, uh, important thing if you see that the platelet of the patient is 150 and below, uh, please suspect cirrhosis. Yeah? Okay. Right. Uh, Next question. Can, yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah, if you don't have the uh, first, uh, you don't have the means to do uh, a fibro scan or elastography, just use the APRI score. I think is probably uh, what do you call that? Uh, good, good enough. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long patients should be on contraception if they are on DAA and after completing DAA? Right. Uh, I think. Uh, like I said, I think uh, following uh, DAA uh, completion, we want to document whether patient achieved cure or not, right? In fact, uh, having hepatitis C is actually not a contraindication for patient to become pregnant, yeah. But uh, what during DAA treatment, because of there is no data about safety of DAA in pregnancy, that's why we advocate contraception. Once they complete the uh, treatment. Uh, I suppose, uh, what do you call that? Uh, we want to tell the patient whether they have cleared the infection or not. Ask them to wait for three months first, yeah? Right. They can stop, uh, uh, what do you call that, contraception, uh, what do you call that, after they have completed the DAA. But I think uh, it's better for them to know that they have cleared the virus as well before they go on and become uh, to become pregnant, yeah? So that we can yes. you know, uh, tell them that, oh, you have cleared the virus, so you can, you know, 
uh, don't have to be worried uh, about passing uh, the virus to your child later on. Yeah. So right, I would wait until three months after treatment. Yes. Uh, there are still a few questions, but I think we still have time, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What will be the next step? This is also the question I wanted to ask. What's yeah. the next step to do when SVR is not achieved? Okay, right. Yeah. And you, you check it after three or four months of treatment completion. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't include the, what do you call that, treatment failure here because, uh, what do you call that? Uh, basically, uh, when, uh, when the patient fails to, to uh, clear the virus, what we do is actually assess why the patient failed to clear the virus. Huh? Is it because of non-compliance or whether the patient have a, what do you call that, a drug-resistant variant of hepatitis C. Yeah? So what I do in my clinic, uh, usually I will send uh, for viral-resistant tests, which uh, can be done in IMR. Uh, and uh, what we can do is actually offer retreatment. Yeah? Retreatment uh, with another combination of DAA. Uh, so for our patient that has, um, uh, what do you call it, received, uh, I think, soft and DACLA, the, what do you call it, retreatment, uh, uh, the, what we can offer is actually another combination such as Likaprovir or Pibrantasvir or soft Vepatasvir uh, for patient. Are they more likely to be uh, genotype? Okay, right. Uh, that's what we thought initially, Datuk, but uh, we actually see quite uh, a few genotype 1A uh, that had failed treatment as well. So, what do you call that saying that genotype 3 per se is difficult to treat, probably is not too uh, true anymore now. We do okay. see genotype 1 that failed treatment as well. Okay, good. Uh, one question is, uh, can completely cured patients, uh, healthcare workers, lah, huh, be involved in healthcare related jobs again, like, you know, yeah. in medicine? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yes. Shouldn't be a problem, isn't yes. it? Yes, uh, shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Uh, somehow I lost uh, a lot of the uh, question posed, but now <laughs> I'm looking at another list. Okay, right. Uh, is methotrexate contraindicated in Hep C patient? Um, I suppose patient who has rheumatoid arthritis uh, who need uh, methotrexate for their illness, uh, uh, you know, and have uh, what do you call it hepatitis C as well. I think what's imp uh, important is to assess the severity of the uh, liver disease before we start on methotrexate lah. And uh, it, it's not uh, really contraindicated, but um, uh, but uh, what do you call that? Uh, if patient has cirrhosis with hepatitis C, rheumatoid arthritis, and you want to consider uh, methotrexate, probably it's not a good uh, you know uh, what do you call that uh, treatment option for patient as well. And uh, because Hep C treatment is now of short duration, three to six months, I think what do you call that? all Hep C treatment uh, should be offered to our patients huh? so that we clear the virus and probably, uh, you know, clear them of one uh, life-threatening illness. Yeah? Right, so methotrexate in combination of DAA, I have to check. Yeah? But what do you call that? Um, met Hold on, huh? let me check whether methotrexate and our DAA is contraindicated or not. But again, a patient who has significant liver fibrosis, you wouldn't want to, you know, use methotrexate. Nah? So, daclatasvir and sofosvivir uh, with methotrexate. Nah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's one uh, very uh, practical question. Nah? Somebody must be treating uh, patients, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if patient defaulted treatment, say right. eight weeks of treatment for uh, mm -hmm. like for Mm -mm. Do we restart treatment on day one or continue from the last dose? All right. Uh, how, how sorry? How many days of uh, they drop the treatment? Uh, fourteen days. Fourteen days. So, uh, uh, started treatment at the eight weeks. At the eight weeks of treatment, uh -huh. they stop for fourteen days. Uh, okay, right. Yeah. Uh, do we go back to day one or do we go back from you know the eight weeks? Okay, right. Uh... Right. What uh we usually do if the what do you call that the if they stop. 
uh, what do you call it, for a short duration, uh, I think 14 days you can uh, still consider rather short. What we can do is actually just resume the remainder of the treatment. Oh, just continue on from where they drop yeah, off. Yeah, you're yeah, correct. But if, but what you call that? yeah, some patient uh, after eight weeks and they disappear and come to you after two months, yeah. So usually mm -hmm. what we do is assess whether they have cleared the virus or not, uh, because uh, there are some studies saying that eight weeks of antiviral uh, has uh, been able to reduce, uh, what do you call that, uh, has been able to achieve clearance rates as well. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Actually, I this uh, question that I wanted to ask my staff mm -hmm. is that uh, you know if they are still actively on drugs, you know, uh, uh, yeah. and a lot of them are on methadone. Do you yeah, start yeah. them on uh, DAA? Yes, yes, we have because they are not very reliable patient anyway. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have many patients on methadone <laughs> that we have started treatment, and uh. What we do is actually we decentralize the Hep C treatment to clinic kesihatan now. So this uh, group of patients, uh, we know that coming to hospital sometimes is a bit, uh, you know, uh, we, a bit tedious for them. Eh? They don't like to come to the hospital, but they want to take their methadone right. So what we do is we ask the health doctors to give their DAA uh, from their methadone clinic. And so they are more, uh, you know, they. they they can be monitored uh, for adherence uh, better in the methadone clinic actually. So we have actually roped in clinic kesihatan doctors, psychiatric doctors to help us out with this uh, decentralization of hepatitis C treatment. Dato. Okay, good. Yeah. There are a few questions uh, related to pregnancy. I think you more or less answered the question already. Yeah. Do you want to add anything more? Okay, right. For pregnant patient with hepatitis C, uh, I think, you, as, as you all know, this is a chronic infection. Let the patient, uh, what do you call it, delivered safely first, yeah? And later on, uh, offered treatment, yeah? Okay, that, that's the, what do you call that? The gist of it. Lah. You don't treat hepatitis, pregnant hepatitis C mothers because uh, lack of safety data with, the, uh, with our DAAs. Lah. They don't do trials on pregnant mothers anyway. Yeah. So let the patient pregnant first, deliver it safely, and then after that you assess them and offer treatment after that. Good. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we take a couple more questions uh, huh, before we uh, end up the uh, we end the session. Are there any cardiac related side effects as a result of DAA treatment, like cardiac arrhythmias? All right. Uh, the drug itself is safe, but uh, I think why do you call that? Um, uh, if why do you call that patient is on amiodarone or that, no? uh, some combination uh, are not uh, cannot be given together. Yeah, so you have to check again. Uh, soft and Dakla, I've used on my patients, uh, even with triple heart disease. I think they tolerate the combination well. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think this probably is the last uh, question we we'll take. Uh, right? It's yeah. almost a uh, time. Uh, in the case of uh, HCC, uh, hepatocellular CA, yeah, yeah. Mm. and with Hep C, is DAA offered to them? Okay, right. Okay, right. Depends on the what do you call that? The uh, stage of the illness, right? If it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, incurable Hep C, uh, HCC in which this is a, a what do you call it, um, multiple lesions everywhere, yeah, and deemed for palliative already. So usually we don't go on to offer treatment because it doesn't confer any benefits anymore. But if the patient has a solitary, solitary lesion, uh, deemed curable, meaning that patient uh, can be, you know, uh, the lesion can be uh, resected or ablated, uh, we usually ask the surgeon to, you know, treat first, uh, what do you call it, either uh, cut it out or ablate it, and after that we go on and offer, uh, uh, what do you call it, treatment for the hepatitis C patient. Yeah, depends on the stage of the liver uh, uh, cancer. That Most was, uh, not because of our uh, uh, surveillance for HCC, we are able to pick up HCC actually at the, uh, rather, you know, uh, early stage and I would say that many of our patients are able to be, you know, resected or ablated eh? and we do go on uh, offering treatment after that. Yeah. 
Actually, I was uh, just reading, uh, you know, uh, the article from the Annal of Hepatology yeah. uh, from Spain, just published uh, sometime this year, you know, mm. to say that uh, DAA may be a risk factor for development and recurrence of uh, hepatocellular cancer. Have you heard of that? Oh, I think there was, what do you call that? Early on when DAAs were, uh, what do you call that? Were, were dished out. I think uh, they 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 saw quite a few HCCs huh, after being treated uh, after being uh, patient treated with DAs. I think later on there were there were many more papers refuting uh, this uh, this statement. Uh, we, uh, the reason because may, maybe the uh, observation earlier on were on smaller numbers, yeah, uh, and probably what do you call that? the uh, cohort of patients uh, uh, were already uh, what do you call that at higher risk of having hepatitis uh, having hcc as well but uh, later observations when they observe more patients being treated with da they don't see increased incidence of hcc in daa receiving population they don't okay. see increased risk of hcc oh. post da treatment yeah. okay that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, because the paper is from uh, Spain, you know. Wait, when was uh, it published, Dato? Yeah. Uh, this year, this exactly year. what month it was, I, I can't find out, but okay, it's in yeah. Annal of Hepatology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it's good to hear that it's, yeah. uh, it's not. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, I think that's all we have time for. And uh, it's uh, slightly beyond four o'clock. Thank oh, you yeah. very much, Dr. Zawani. Okay, you have you cleared a lot of doubts and uh, have helped us to understand, you know, about the treatment of Hep C. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is, uh, you know, it's so much, um, so very promising now, isn't it? Yes, Compared yeah. to like three or four years ago. Correct, correct. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much and uh, thank, thank the College of Physicians for organizing this. And uh, just to remind everybody that next week, there's another webinar on acute liver failure and indication for liver transplant. So uh, you'll be welcome to join the webinar. So thanks again to uh, the speaker, Dr. Zawani, and to all the audience uh, who have stayed, uh, you know, to, to the whole time with the uh, webinar, as well as uh, many of you uh, participating in, the, uh, in asking questions. So thanks again, and, uh, and all the best to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Q. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mabel. Thank you. I'm trying to Thank you, do Dr. the QR code first. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, let me know if you need any help. Yeah, let me see whether I can get it in or not. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mabel, and thank you, Zawani, again. Thank you, Dato. Thank you, Dato. Okay, bye. The best to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Bye. Bye bye.